Kia koutou, kia koutou. Good morning, everyone. Thank you very much for joining us today. I'm John Small, Chair of the Congress Commission. In a moment, I'm going to take you through our preliminary findings from our market study into personal banking services, along with some draft recommendations. And then we'll open up the floor to media on the call to ask questions. But I just want to start by acknowledging everyone who's contributed to the study so far. We know that we've asked a lot of those within the sector and that this comes at a time when the Commission is also engaging with the banking sector on the open banking application and on our own forthcoming consultation on account to account payments. So I want to extend a particular thanks to the bank CEOs and their teams who have engaged with us openly and invested the time to ensure that they've responded fully to the questions we've asked of them. I also want to acknowledge the engagement from other interested parties, particularly the smaller banks, non-bank deposit takers, fintechs, and consumers. Our analysis has benefited immensely from the different perspectives that we've been shared with over the last nine months or so. And just before I get into it, I also want to give a shout out to the market study team, a small but perfectly formed group of economists, lawyers, skilled investigators, and analysts who have interviewed and facilitated our discussions and pursued and analysed literally thousands of documents. And also to my fellow commissioners who have worked with us on the study, myself, along with myself, that is Anne Cullinan, our Deputy Chair, Tristan Gilbertson, Rakahia Toe, and Brian Chappell, who is actually with me today to, um, uh, to help answer the questions that they come at the end. Okay, so, uh, let's get into it. Uh, an overview of um, the study to start with. Um, as you may know, um, our counterparts in the UK and Australia and Ireland and other places have un undertaken market studies into various aspects of personal banking, but this competition study is a first for New Zealand. It goes without saying that this sector is hugely important to New Zealanders and to the broader economy. Pretty much every household in New Zealand's got a bank account and a debit card, and nearly 60% of us have a credit card. The residential mortgage market is about worth about $340 billion in overall lending. That's why our 14-month time frame um, has been necessary to ensure a comprehensive, robust, and in-depth study of competition in the personal banking services that Kiwis use. It has given us time to ensure that we've listened to everyone who wants their voice heard, including the general public. This is a sector that matters to nearly every New Zealander, so it's important that, to ensure that we've had the time to get it right. Uh, the terms of reference are set down by the um, Minister of Commerce and Consumer Affairs, and they required us to delve into specific areas. You'll see, of course, in, uh, amongst those that uh, it includes indicators of financial performance, including profitability. So that's the starting point for the study. From there, we published uh, our uh, preliminary issues paper in August 2023. Um, in that paper, we proposed a narrowing of our analysis to what we saw as the key focus for competition in personal banking services and the ones that most Kiwis are literally invested in, namely deposit accounts and home loans. Uh, during the consultation process, we did hear calls for other products and services to be included, and we have briefly looked at one of those, which is international transactions, where we believe there could be scope for uh, a more detailed consideration uh, in due course. But otherwise, we've uh, stuck with the, uh, the, the services identified being deposit accounts and home loans. Um, our consultation process so far has been very broad. Um, from targeted requests, we've obtained and reviewed about 2,000 documents, uh, including through the use of our statutory powers to demand information. We've also conducted over 50 interviews and meetings with banking and non-banking providers, which has been crucial to help our, uh, shape our analysis of the market. Equally important has been wide engagement with consumers, consumer groups, iwi Māori, fintechs and others, both directly and through a survey. This has helped paint a picture of how the market is working for customers 
but also those who are seeking to enter and help drive innovation. And additionally, we uh, commissioned econometric analysis um, from academics at the University of Auckland, looking at bank efficiency, market power, and interest rate dynamics, including pass-through of the OCR. So a quick overview of the industry. Um, here's a representation of uh, the registered banks that are trading in New Zealand. Um, and there's quite a few of them, as you, as you see it. We've grouped them there in, in, in various ways. Um, 17 registered banks, supplemented, of course, by a number of non-bank providers and other credit providers. So on the face of it, you might think that looks like a, a diverse uh, um, set of players, and it is a diverse set of players, that's, that's true. But that's not the full competition story. Um, so before I just at the main findings, let me just talk about a little bit of context that's relevant here. Um, and we'll elaborate on these uh, as we go through the discussion. Um, the first point is that, as with previous market studies, we have found that well-intentioned regulation has raised barriers to competition. So we'll talk about that more in a minute, but um, we will point also to opportunities to address these issues, including through uh, the implementation of the new Deposit Takers Act. Open banking is also part of the context. The short story here is that New Zealand is well behind in this area and consumers are missing out. There are several initiatives underway in this space that are relevant to uh, the context of this market study, including the uh, proposal to recommend designation of the interbank payment network consideration of the industry's API authorization and the forthcoming uh, customer and product data bill, otherwise known as the CDR framework that the government is pursuing. And finally, uh, there's a select committee opportunity which has been flagged in the coalition agreements uh, to consider um, aspects of the banking sector. And uh, we, we think that this report will provide some useful context to, uh, to that review um, and could be strongly complementary to it. Okay, to the preliminary findings, this slide summarizes um, a lot of what we found, uh, not absolutely everything, but a lot. In essence, um, what we have here is a stable two-tier oligopoly. Um, at the top is the, uh, the majors, BNZ, ANZ, ASB, Westpac, collectively they, they control about 90% of the assets of registered banks in New Zealand. Um, at the bottom, sorry, uh, at the, the, mo the most numerous group there um, with 5% is the second tier, uh, that's TSB, Heartland and so on. Uh, they have about 5% of total registered bank assets. They um, tend to target niche markets, and they're not a threat to the majors. Um, and we know that because when we look at majors' documents, they don't mention these, these parties at all. They don't really pay attention to them. Of course, the smaller players in the, in the second tier pay a, a lot of attention to what's going on um, in the majors' uh, tier, the top tier. In the middle, is Kiwi Bank, and we, we put it in the middle. It's not actually in either tier, it's stuck in the middle. Um, it's materially smaller than the majors, materially bigger than the next lower tier, tier down, with about 5% of total assets. Kiwi Bank is watched by the majors. They take account of it in their, in their documents and when they're setting their prices, but it's not currently a serious threat. And then if we go up into the top tier, um, what we found there is really stable market shares over time. Um, no serious threat from anyone that's not in that tier. Uh, price matching conduct between majors within that tier. Competition that is sporadic rather than sustained. And consistently high profits. So um, our, and then Right at the bottom, we've got the fintechs, which are struggling to get into the sector and, and lack, sort of lack a serious opportunity to do that. 
So our main concern is with that top tier and, um, and with ways of promoting competition um, within it and, and against that group um, in aggregate. Okay, um, continuing on with um, key preliminary findings, uh, also within that top tier, but broader as well, um, underinvestment in core systems. Uh, we've found um, core banking systems um, from the majors that are, have not been maintained and invested in. Some of them have been depreciated to the point where they've got zero book value. Um, and we see this as a symptom of weak competition because we think in a, in a competitive market that banks would be forced to upgrade those systems in order to produce better products and innovative services for the market. Um, and they're not being forced to do that because competition is not strong enough. So it's a symptom of weak competition, but it's also something of a barrier to more competition. Um, and that's because the fintechs who are keen to get in and start providing um, new services to end users uh, need to interconnect with um, these legacy systems. And so there's a mismatch in technology that's, that's part of the reason, not the entire reason, but part of the reason uh, that fintechs are struggling to get into the market. Second point um, is uh, when we ask the banks about um, this um, we saw as underinvestment in technology. They told us that um, that the reason was uh, that um, they needed to, to spend a lot of money investing in compulsory regulatory investment, an investment required by regulators to keep up with um, the regulatory system. And that's certainly true. There has been a lot of uh, capital expenditure go into that category. Um, but we, so notwithstanding that, we consider that, co that weak competition is a contributing factor to underinvestment. The third point is that regulation has reinforced this two tier structure that we're talking about. Um, the majors in particular have had lower prudential capital holding requirements than their rivals for similar risks for about 15 years and significantly lower, um, like at least 15% less capital for the same loan. Um, for example, a, you know, a, a first mortgage backed home loan with a LVR of less than 80%. Um, uh, it, it's been possible for the, the majors to hold significantly less capital against that loan than is required by uh, the Reserve Bank for any other loan provider. So that has reinforced the, the two-tier structure by making it harder for the smaller banks to challenge the bigger ones. Concerned also about uh, some of the incentives facing mortgage brokers. Um, there's there's uh, indications that uh, brokers may be uh, acting with their own interests uh, and um, are giving insufficient attention to the interests of their clients, and so we've got some concerns around that and some recommendations to address it. Um, and also the absence of an effective account switching service is a concern to us. Um, several customer groups are poorly served by competition alone. Um, particularly, there's some obvious examples of this, uh, such as um, Maori freehold land, where it's very difficult to get mortgages due to security issues. Uh, and also, uh, more broadly, um, in the sector, uh, rules such as those governing uh, anti-money laundering that make it difficult for uh, certain people and, uh, to, to get even get a bank account, um, refugees, prisoners, people fleeing domestic violence uh, and the like, um, struggle to get served. Um, and also there's uh, other laws and regulations across the economy apart from prudential regulation that are having an effect on competition here. And the final point there is that limited comp comp uh, competition is contributing to persistently high profitability. Uh, I know that everyone's 
resonated with quite shock us. Um, and I'll just say that what we've done here is to um, use the information that's already available. We've listened very carefully and read the submissions that were received on bank profitability, uh, which provided a number of potential explanations for high bank profits. Um, we're not convinced by them. Um, we accept some of the points that have been made. Um, however, our view remains that limited comp comp uh, competition is a contributor to high profitability. So that's the analysis of the problem um, as we see it uh, in summary form. So how do these, uh, how do these problems arise? We see four main factors that are contributing to this and impeding the ability of smaller providers to effectively compete. Starting with the structural advantages of the major banks, um, just the scope and scale uh, of uh, these entities and the strength of their brands and their geographic reach, um, those are massive advantages to overcome for a small niche player. Add to that the funding cost issues um, that I've talked about, partly on the sense of um, prudential capital, but also in the wholesale markets, um, these banks have uh, significant advantages over their rivals. So these are baked in structural advantages that are hard to uh, overcome. The second one is a set, a set of regulatory barriers to entry and expansion. Um, I've mentioned some of those already, but um, Let's note also that the cost of compliance um, or uh, the regulatory um, innovations that, that we acknowledge that everyone has, has had to pay for, uh, they fall disproportionately um, hot heavily on smaller providers because they have a smaller customer base over which to spread those costs. Um, barriers to customer switching are um, a third contributor. Um, there's an issue here about, partly an issue about perception, um, that it's perceived to be more difficult to switch banks than it actually is. Um, but it al is also difficult to switch, um, particularly transactions accounts that have, uh, uh, that have a lot of inflows and outflows, direct um, uh, regular payments set up in and out. And those transactions accounts are key to the, um, the main bank relationships that everybody, all players in the sector, want to uh, want to um, attract because they um, they uh, generate customers that tend to stay with you and buy other services. So those main bank relationships, uh, get, getting customers to switch to you uh, if you're a smaller player is really difficult um, with those uh, main bank relationships. So um, there's a, that meant that there's a large proportion of customers who are, call them sticky or disengaged with the market. And there's, a, there's a, a, an ability along with that for the banks to target customers who are engaged and give them customer specific discounts that are not available to everybody else. We see this particularly in the home loan market where, um, where targeted discounts are common uh, and they're not available to anybody unless they are engaged enough to be out there hunting and asking for them. So that allows the banks essentially to split the customer base into two groups. One group gets a better deal than the others and, um, and, and, and the, the group that doesn't get the best deal, the disengaged group, is by far the largest. Um, and then finally, uh, barriers to innovation. Um, there's a lot of barriers that the fintechs face. Um, we'll talk about, we talk about a lot of them in the report, but just to give you a wee bit of a flavor of it, uh, you know, one of the most basic things that a fintech needs is a bank account. And as they told us that this was one of their biggest risks and concerns was that it was difficult for them to get a bank account and they were at risk of losing it after they got it. And some of that goes to the anti-money laundering rules. Uh, a FinTech automatically falls into a higher risk category and the same rules apply to everybody. 
So that makes uh, is also an impediment to innovation. So there's no civil bullet here. There's a lot of uh, issues across the whole uh, industry, um, and so we think there's a need for multifaceted solutions to help drive competition. So what are they? Um, well, uh, bearing in mind this is a draft report, we're really keen to hear what people have got to say about um, the analysis I've presented so far, and also about these in particular, about these draft recommendations that, that we've outlined. Um, we've grouped them into four areas, um, and we think that they need to, they all need um, action. They're all targeting at different um, aspects of the, of the broader problem. First one is to improve the capital position of smaller providers and Kiwi Bank. Um, this is really directed at the Reserve Bank, and we know that the Reserve Bank is thinking about this, so we're encouraging them in the direction that they are um, already heading. Um, we're looking for, however, for the bank to um, really work hard to ensure that their rules are competitively neutral and that smaller players are better able to compete. Um, so there's a there's a lot of detail in the report, but that is the summary um, that is the summary there of the um, the recommendation to the Reserve Bank on credential and other aspects um, of regulation that, that are in its purview. The second one is that Kiwi Bank's owner uh, we think should consider what's necessary to make it a disruptive competitor, including how to provide it with access to more capital. I'm targeting Kiwi Bank here because it's the biggest, you know, the best prospect in the near term for disruption, for disruption, comp disruptive competition to get a, what's known as a maverick into the market. Um, and that's because it's, it's already of a sufficient scale. Um, to, to be able to make that leap. But there's a lot that needs to happen. Uh, we understand that um, you know, Kiwi Bank, as with others, other banks, other smaller banks, um, are capital constrained um, and that this really limits the extent to which they can um, really take it to the majors. But the second reason we're focusing here on Kiwi Bank is because we think that once uh, 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 an extra entity like Kiwi Bank uh, starts aggressively trying to grow, it, that will automatically destabilise the top tier. Once they start taking market share of uh, one of the big four or others of the big four, that stability in market shares that we've seen over time will start to break down and that will help to erode um, that uh, fairly weak and sporadic competition, we think. So it, but it's important that that, um, that, it, that that is disrupted in some way. However, we're conscious, of course, that um, today's disruptor could easily become tomorrow's oligopolist. And so we consider that the sector needs a lot more than just a temporary boost to competition, which brings us to open banking. And here, uh, we think, put simply, uh, progress needs to be accelerated. Uh, this has been, um, you know, the, the New Zealand is well behind in this area. Um, that's to some extent an advantage because we can learn from some of the issues and, uh, that have been, that have arisen in other markets. Um, but it's now time to really put the pedal down and we think the government should set clear deadlines, work with the industry to ensure open banking is fully operational by June 2026. We also think more specifically that that will require um, regulatory backstops that uh, are clear and provide a credible threat of intervention so as to drive uh, industry to, towards uh, solutions that, um, that are going to be uh, good for everybody but very challenging for the majors. Um, secondly, in this area, uh, the barriers imposed by the anti-money laundering uh, rules and regimes um, need to be addressed, uh, particularly to uh, make it easier for fintechs to get into the market, but this will also assist at the, at the other end of the market where um, individual consumers are uh, finding it difficult to get banking services. Um, 
the third set of recommendations about empowering, uh, enhancing the regulatory system. Um, so there's a new deposit taking uh, deposit takers act uh, in, in place and being implemented by the Reserve Bank. There are a lot of uh, aspects of implementing that that the Reserve Bank is in charge of, and we're asking it to explicitly and transparently consider competitive effects when it's making those decisions. Uh, things such as articulating how it's applying the purposes and principles of that act to the deposit compensation scheme levy advice um, that is forthcoming. Um, also, uh, how it's factoring um, competition into its analysis of the potential for broader access to ESAS accounts, which is the interbank clearing system um, through, you know, through which banks deposit uh, cash with the Reserve Bank and earn the OCR on that. Currently, that's uh, the number of accounts, uh, banks that have accounts um, that link into the ESAS system is is low, uh, and um, if banks don't have an account, an ESAS account themselves, they essentially have to pay one of their competitors to um, to obtain ESAS access. Um, also, within the Deposit Takers Act, there's a um, there's, there's a principle that says that the Reserve Bank should seek to maintain competition. We think that's a bit weak given what we've found about uh, competition generally, and so we would like that to be uh, changed so that it says the Reserve Bank should promote competition. Um, generally speaking, banks, uh, government and policy makers should seek competitive neutrality across banks and other providers wherever possible, and this crops up in a, in a range of different rules where you see um, you know, a number of different acts that specify that banks have to do this or particular banks have to do that. And finally, um, the Consumer, the Credit Contracts and Consumer Finance Act um, should be competitively neutral with respect to home loan refinancing to make it easier for consumers to switch providers. Of course, as you'll know, there is a review, a policy review underway of that act uh, at present, so that's something that will feed into. Um, work that's already underway. Our last set of um, draft recommendations is about empowering consumers. Um, the switching service really needs to be uh, improved. The bank account switching service really needs to improve. We found um, on, just on this point when we asked uh, banks about whether they uh, would recommend that service to somebody considering switching to them, they pretty much all said no, they wouldn't. Uh, which tells you all you need to know about the effectiveness of that service. Uh, so we think we can do better there. Um, we're concerned about some of the ways that um, home loan information is provided, uh, and, and this is particularly about um, things like cashbacks uh, that um, are offered sometimes uh, with home loans, and it can be quite difficult to actually assess the um, the merits of two different offers when they're, when they're framed in a way that's got an interest rate and a cash back associated with it. Um, mortgage lenders um, should prorate all clawbacks to broker commissions and cash incentives. So what happens here is that uh, with cash incentives, um, if you don't, if you switch away, if you sign up for a, say a two-year fixed mortgage and you get a cash incentive for that, and then 18 months into it, uh, you want to switch your mortgage. Um, the uh, the cash incentive gets clawed back, and sometimes in a way that's disproportionate to um, the the impact on the bank. So they, those should be prorated over time, we believe. Um, staying with mortgages and mortgage brokers, um, I, I indicated that we we're concerned about um, some of the, some of the incentives facing uh, mortgage brokers. So we've got a recommendation here for the FMA to produce guidance and monitor mortgage advisor compliance. They do have duties and obligations under the Financial Markets Conduct Act, but it's, um, it, it, it appears to us that that needs 
um, more attention from the regulator. Um, industry and government should prioritise work to reduce barriers to lending on Maori freehold land. There are some great initiatives that have been uh, implemented by various banks, but these are these are difficult to uh, standardise and scale up, and we think more could be done there. And finally, uh, we would like to see um, widespread availability of basic banking accounts. Um, so this is, these are the this is for the unbanked sector of our community, um, and there's a so there are a lot of people who just can't get a basic bank account. There should be no risk, really, um, no AML-related risk uh, to somebody having an account that's locked down to basic, really basic services, perhaps with some value uh, thresholds around it that allow people to get banked, um, uh, even if they're um, in, in really difficult circumstances. So in summary, uh, just to wrap it up, we've got a stable two-tier oligopoly with limited competition for the top tier. Kiwi Bank exerts some comp competitive pressure, but it lacks the capital bank backing to consistently be a genuine catalyst. And, and also, uh, Kiwi Bank is not the answer by itself. Open banking really needs to uh, kick in in order to provide um, disruptive forces over the long term. Uh, in this industry. Regulatory environments have created barriers to entry and market, uh, market entry and expansion, um, and the perceived hassle of switching has led to inertia, uh, meaning that many Kiwis are missing out uh, on the benefits of competition. Next steps are that um, we are calling for submissions um, by the 18th of April. There will then be a consultation conference um, in the week commencing the 13th of May. There will be cross submissions after that, and our final report will be uh, is due on the 20th of August. So um, I do want to emphasize that we want to hear from everybody who's got a view on this, whether they're a market player, a customer, or an interested observer. Um, and um, that now, I think, we'll hand back to our MC and open up the floor to media on the call for questions. Thank you. Once again, if you wish to ask a question, please type it into the Ask a Question box and click Submit. A reminder, we will only be accepting media questions at this time. Your first question comes from Ainsley from Bloomberg News. How are the Reserve Bank's current prudential capital settings impeding competition? What should the settings be? Okay, so um, the, the way that, so in principle, um, all banks have the same requirements, but in practice, uh, the same capital holding requirements, but in practice, uh, several banks, and they happen to be the majors and only the majors, um, who are uh, designated systemically important for the domestic economy, they have been granted the opportunity to use internal modelling uh, to estimate the risks associated with their portfolios. And the result of that internal modelling uh, process has been that for loans of similar risk, they've been able to hold a lot less capital. So it's not, so it, 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 it's tied up with that process. Uh, that, 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 that internal modeling process is what has given them the ability to, to get um, much lower capital settings. The bank recognized this, the Reserve Bank recognized this recently and put in a floor that says, um, well, as a result of your internal modeling, you're not allowed to have capital holdings below 85% of the standard rules that we apply to everybody else. Uh, but that's still a 15% discount even now. Uh, and that's not counting the fact that these domestically systemically important banks uh, really, and the, and the bank agrees with this, should hold more capital because they are systemically important. 
Um, so the settings, we think that the, the settings um, should be, we can see a, we can see a case for in, internal modeling um, on lines that are, um, you know, perhaps difficult uh, to, to easily assess business loans and that kind of thing. Um, but there are many categories. I mean, a lot of the lending that is done by banks is home lending. Uh, and um, those, the risks associated with a given type of home loan um, don't vary depending on which bank has advanced the loan. And so we don't see why uh, prudential capital should vary either. Thank you. Your next question comes from Tom from Stuff NZ. The Commerce Minister has sounded more circumspect about the potential benefits of open banking stating. Open banking is not going to be a panacea, but offers the prospect over time of making elements of banking subject to greater competition. Do you agree with that assessment? I do broadly, um, but, I, uh, but I also think it's well worth pursuing um, and that we don't know what kind of innovation will be unleashed uh, once that once, once those um, facilities are available to people we also know you know from our own payments work that there's a lot of um, pent-up demand for access and um, fintechs that have got business cases that they really want to get on with uh, and you know so open payments is one as a subset of open banking um, so we, we you know, we, we recognise that, uh, that this is a complicated area, but we don't accept that it's one where New Zealanders should just, uh, you know, go without uh, the potential benefits. We think it's um, well worth pursuing and we think it, it should be done in a timely way and we, and we also think that some government uh, backing is needed to make that happen. Thank you. Your next question comes from Rurari from Consumer NZ. The abridged report says that Comcom has been surprised by the limited investment by banks into their core banking systems. To what extent has this increased New Zealand consumers' vulnerability to scams and is increased security of customer funds not a potentially vital avenue of competition? Uh, security of funds, yes. Um, that, I mean, obviously, that's really important. I, I don't, I don't think we have any evidence to, to link the underinvestment in core IT systems to scams. Though uh, I think I think scams are a, a different beast and a rapidly evolving one, and that, that will require um, effort across uh, banks and other um, parts of the economy as well to address. Oh yeah, so there's, there's there's already yeah there's, there's already work underway um, by banks on uh, you know, to to tackle scams. I you know we're, so we think that that's a we don't see that as a key kind of competitive issue. We think it's probably something that's that's general across the economy and that needs to be tackled um, uh, as such. Thank you. Jenny from Good Apologies. Jenny from Good Returns and Just the Business asks, has the Commerce Commission looked at the RBNZ's consultation on how it will implement the Deposit Takers Act? Would you agree that there's a risk smaller players will be driven out of business as a result? Um, we have um, taken an interest in the implementation of the Deposit Takers Act, uh, yes. Um, and we've noted that the Reserve Bank itself has raised the prospect of um, some smaller players exiting the market. Um, we, are, we are really concerned to ensure that the playing field is level and that, and that, and that the proportionality uh, framework that is, um, that, that is required to give effect to this Act um, takes due account of the fact that uh, Know, the, of, of the risks that are involved um, and the costs that that uh, failure in different parts of the system pose on on the, on the broader uh, whole. So yeah, uh, short answer is yes. But, uh, on current settings, we think there is a risk, uh, and we think that we think the bank should uh, 
look at that really closely. Thank you. Your next question is from Tom from Stuff NZ. Should the Commission set an objective for a minimum level of bank churn and leave the exact mechanics of ensuring there was more competition for services up to them? Does the Commission agree mobile number portability has been a success in the telco sector? And should the Commission consider mandating bank number portability despite the concerns over costs? Three questions there. Um, the first one, uh, should, should we set an objective for a minimum level of bank churn that leave the exact mechanics uh, uh, to, the, to the sector? Um, I, I've never heard of that being done um, anywhere, anywhere else, and I'm not sure how you would enforce it um, unless you were to say, you know, every bank has to lose X percent of customers every year, which seems, as I say, difficult to enforce. Um, and so we, I, I think um, our view would probably be that the, the, the way to go here is to um, promote that uh, the switching service that that is there that's not working very well. Um, and um, part of that actually is um, getting visibility over who's using it, who's inquiring what the results of that are. We've seen, we compare in the report, we compare our service with what's done in the UK, uh, where the switching service is governed differently. And a big benefit of that, um, that, that approach, the UK approach, is that you get visibility over um, exactly, you know, uh, what's going on in the market, rather than what we have now, which we, we really don't know. Um, the second question uh, and third question are about um, bank number portability, um, and should we consider mandating that despite concerns over costs? Um, look, we, we again, this goes to the switching service, and again, our comparator is the UK system, which seems to work pretty well. Um, we uh, we haven't. We haven't done a detailed study of the costs of number, bank number portability um, because it seems that there are um, these precedent examples where switching can work um, reasonably effectively. So we'd probably prefer to uh, to lean on those. Thank you. Uh, your next question is from Jenny from Good Returns and Just the Business. What evidence does the Commission have that mortgage brokers are serving their own interests and ignoring their customer needs? Um, I don't think ignoring the customer needs is, I, I hope I didn't say that, that's not what I meant. Um, but um, we, we've looked at how the mortgage broker sector operates and we know that um, any given broker uh, will work typically through an aggregated platform and have access to some banks, but probably not all banks. Um, so that's one thing we know. And I don't, I'm not sure that if you went to your mortgage broker, they would tell you that. Um, the other thing we know is that banks offer different, not just different levels of commission to mortgage brokers, but different structures of commission, including whether or not there's trailing components to it and what the upfront commission fee is. So um, from a broker's point of view, uh, they, will get, they will get different amounts of money from different banks. Um, and again, I'm not sure when you go to your mortgage broker whether they declare that to you. Um, so it, those are the sort of concerns that we've got and this is why we're recommending um, that the FMA uh, monitor this and put out some guidance on how they should operate. Thank you. There are no further questions at this time. I'll now hand back to Dr. John Small for closing remarks. Um, so thank you very much. Um, and just to emphasize again, this is the draft. Um, we uh, uh, retain a very open mind about where this goes. Um, we hope that the analysis that's in the report will be useful to uh, people interested in the topic. 
and we look forward to uh, hearing views uh, in the coming months. Thank you very much for your time this morning.